all set? Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How you all doing? Great. How's the seminar going? Awesome. Well, this morning, as you can see, we're filming. So try to keep your language good. Don't fall asleep. Otherwise, we will take pictures of you. Don't be focused. No. Now, this morning, I'm going to do things a little bit different. How many of you, not too many yet, have been in a presentation of mine? How many of you have taken the certification course? None. OK? Well, you're going to be excited, because I'm going to announce this morning a little bit later. Big announcement. OK? But this morning, I'm doing things differently than I normally do. Normally, I just go through the protocols and all that as to how to deal with extremities. This morning, we're going over x-ray protocols. All the different areas, so you know when you look at an x-ray, how you can at least start from that picture, snapshot in time, as to what you need to see on the patient and do your differential diagnosis. So then we're going to look at shoulders, so you know what a misaligned scapula looks like, what a GH looks like misaligned, how such it is. So at least gives you an idea where to start, then go to the patient and verify, and then of course your last verification before deciding to adjust would be from the patient, right? How many times have you heard that you always clear the spine first before you do any adjusting or any evaluation, right? Because it can change. And that was one of the things that Dr. Gonstead did, is that he helped a lot of extremity conditions by just adjusting the spine. And I'm going to have to tell you that, of course, he was the master of adjusting and evaluating and knowing what the major was. But the thing about it was is that I think he, his patients are different than the patients that we have today. They were more physical, less toxic world. They probably ate better. They didn't have GMO, uh, you know, things like that at that time. And now we have a little different. More toxic, less activity, physical, you know, all those things. I'm going to have you film later. Okay. Did you film for me before? Did you? No. Oh, you did? Okay. But we're going to Facebook Live when we get in hands up. So he focused in on that and when you look at a lot of um, his case histories before I wrote the book I spent a whole week here looking at all his case histories and basically what it said and you know it was everything and I think Dr. John Dr. Alex you know pointed this out that he would put down sick or low back pain or knee pain that's all I put so, and when you look at the card, a lot of times, even though he had an x-ray of that extremity of the knee pain, no adjustment, it was all spot. So, you absolutely, my mentor, there he is. He's the one that got me to do this. Dr. Gunderson. Are you going to be here the whole day? Yeah. Would you do a testimonial for me in front of the camera? Sure. Okay. Later, after we get done. Because we're filming everything today. But anyway, so you absolutely, and I'm going to tell you one thing right now that I've seen, and I'll be coming on 43 years coming up in February at the end of this year, is that the predisposing factor to your extremity injury is because of the lack of innervation to that extremity from the spine. Everybody hear what I said? It literally predisposes that joint. And that's why when you have different dynamics of injury, you can end up with different misalignments or injuries or tissue changes. Absolutely. Okay, so that's why if we took everybody up to a big, or lifted you all up in a crane and dropped you the same way, 
the same area, you would have different entries. And the reason why is that you have different subluxations, you have different pre-existing pre conditions. You may have already had other injuries. And so then that precipitates out to something different. And that would also warrant different treatment. So that's one of the things that if you're taking care of teams, you want to do a preliminary, bless you, preliminary evaluation before the season, see where their weaknesses are. And if you really want to lower the overall injury rate, you would start previous to that. Okay, taking care of that. Super, super important. And then evaluate the extremities, then put them on some kind of rehabilitation program along with adjusting the spine or even the extremities to lessen that risk to that joint. And that's kind of how I got started. And if you're getting young, you're a young practitioner getting raised, you know, as a student getting ready to graduate, and you want to springboard your practice, that's the way I did mine. Is that it's, people just, you know, the doctors didn't do extremities. How many, what do you think the overall percentage, let's just say the United States, that do extremities competently. What do you think that percentage is? Now, competently to me is more than doing a specific evaluation and applying a specific adjustment. And it's not just one per area. What do you think that percentage is? Isn't that terrible? You know, when I wrote the book, and that was in 2011, that's this one right here, okay? And by the way, the bookstore office will have plenty of these. I bought a whole case for them, okay? Is that I said it was about 11%. I don't know why I was influenced to think it was 11% at that time, maybe because it was 2011, but it's, it's pathetic. So if you have any interest, that's a niche to develop your practice. And not only, you know, one of the things that we've seen just doing stats is that increases your practice 30% at the minimum. If you x-ray, you adjust extremities and charge for it. And I think you should especially if you do the certification, become certified, that's a higher level of skill set. You should be compensated for that. <clears throat> and then maybe some kind of form of rehabilitation. But you think that's accurate, Dwight? Pretty close, 30%? Probably more than that, if you're really x-raying and, and doing re rehab. But if you're just x-raying and adjusting, it's gotta be at least 30%. And you add for that, and there's codes for billing. Those, so you're doing insurance, that could be compensated that way. So I really think you need to evaluate and look at that because there's a lot of teams, there are a lot of people out there that need good care and they have absolutely no alternative outside of invasive care. It's either injection, well, usually they rehab first. They call it physical therapy. Then they inject anti-inflammatories and then some kind of surgery. Okay? What would it mean to your practice or even say your family if you could prevent having joint replacement? There's no reason why you can't do that. Especially in the lower, lower extremity, that's more weight bearing. So it's more hip than that. Of course, we know the pelvis influences that significantly. Posterior rotated sacrum on the side of an IN and its combination. And then, if it stays there long enough and it increases the Q angle, then now you've got not only a hip problem, but a knee problem. It could only fall all the way down to an ankle problem because of this cycle back. 
and then all that deteriorates. But you can change that and stop that process. You know, and if you're doing a report of findings and you just tell somebody, well, here, you got a posterior rotated sacrum on this side, it's fixated, and uh, already got knee issues and that, you can tell them absolutely within a certain amount of time they're going to have hip degenerative changes, especially if their nutrition's poor. Okay? Once we get done with the protocols and the x-ray, we're going to break real short, five-minute break. We're going to set up for hands-on demonstration. And I'm going to leave it as an open forum. You can challenge me and say, what about this, what about that? Usually what, it, what happens is you want me to fix something on you. Okay. Well, we'll get in a corner or whatever. Just make sure you don't get in front of the camera. And so we're doing this so we can archive it. So you'll have access to it. Is basically what I'm doing. Okay. And so we'll break. We'll come back. And we'll do that, and then we'll finish a little bit before nine. Okay. Any questions? Any comments? Why? Because you're you stay up too late. You dance. You're dehydrated. Yes, sir. Question of curiosity. What are your thoughts? But what do you think leads to like that five percent paragraphs that Well, one is probably because you're unique because you've got a handlebar mustache and that requires a lot of care. So you have to have an expertise. You've got to be willing to go through the process on a regular basis to maintain that look. Would you agree? Okay. Then you have to have some kind of equipment, mustache, wax, something. But the biggest thing is, I think, and Dwight and I have had discussions of this, and I don't know if he agrees 100% that it starts at the schools, that you don't get the absolute best specificity of adjusting there. More of a philosophy, and they give you an idea, well, this is what's going to make you successful, and you have a business plan. But it's, I hate to tell you, if, unless you've got phenomenal charisma, it's going to take results to build your practice. Right, Dwight? It takes results. And if you get results, it's not that hard. Because they're going to refer. How do you think this place was built? Because downtown, they were out the door in bad weather waiting on Dr. Gonstead. How'd that happen? Well, obviously, he got good results, right? So that's why you got up early today and came in. So you did the extra mile, just like he got up early to do the mustache. I don't think it was already that way this morning. Pretty much? OK. Does it come off? <laughs> no, but once you investigate and get that additional information, you need to develop your skill set. You need to practice things. You need to evaluate. You need to get resources. You need to get a book. You need to look at videos. You need to go online. You know, you constantly look at things. And what I present to you, do you think I learned that in the first year? Everything I'm going to tell you today? No. And the reason why you're here and why I'm talking to you is because I want to give you what I saw for 43 years on top of what Gonstead taught me and Dr. Alex, Dr. Doug, and everybody else. And you'll ask me, well, why don't you do it this way? Our school tells us to do it this way. And then what's my answer? Well, all I can tell you is in 43 years, this is what I found works the best based on Gonstead principles. 
everything I present to you exactly like the chapters? No. But when Dr. Alex and Dr. Doug looked at what I had to say, he goes, well, I think Gottsdorf would have been proud. And he probably was going to say what you were going to say. Because it still goes with what he always talked about, what his philosophy was. Even though he didn't, you know, exactly say it that way. Okay? And I'm going to tell you things that you shouldn't do. Because I made the mistake and went through the process. And I'm standing in front of you now saying, I didn't do everything exactly right. But I made the mistakes now, you, if I tell you, don't do them. So the reason why, you've got to go the extra mile, like anything. If you think you're in this and you're just going to go through the process, well, you've got to decide what kind of practice you want. Right? High volume. You know, I don't know, I mean, there are a lot of high volume gods to practices. But you're working a lot of hours because we have a process, right, that takes time. We have, you know, visualization, primary assessment, secondary assessment, instrumentation, you got x-ray, you know, all those things that we add into the criteria is this going to be adjusted, right? And then you got to follow through with all those things, but I think they don't, people don't go the extra mile is what the deal is. And you don't practice, and you don't try to hone your skills to get as very the very best that you can. They don't look at X-rays or even X-ray the extremity. I think that's you know why did Gonstead develop that? Because he wanted a blueprint, right? He wanted to see how it was affecting the rest of the body. And of course, his his mechanical engineering basically played into that a little bit. He was used to looking at drawings and things like that, and applied it to the spine and how things move. Well, I've taken that and put it to the extremities. There's not a lot of other extremity type programs that have anything to do with x-ray. Outside of x-ray, it's see if there's fracture dislocation of pathology. It's not an end all, but it's a starting point. So you have an idea what's affecting what? What's the major stabilizer of the joint? Do I need to fix that first? Especially if your palpatory skills are poor. At least get an idea and then go from there. Did I answer your question? So the whole key is you've got to get into it and really develop and then, and then take things on. I was fortunate enough, all the doctors in the clinic and around me, they didn't know anything about extremities. They referred them to me and then I basically you know, if I didn't know, I'd ask Dr. Doug or Dr. Alex, what do you think about this case? <clears throat> I'll never forget in Dr. You know, I don't know how many times I sent Dr. Doug's class. I don't know, 75 times? Slow learner, I guess. 128 seminars here. And we'd look at knee misalignments and we'd say, uh, you know what? A PIN femur, it just doesn't happen that often. He had one in his file, and I saw one, and I took it up, and he said, oh yeah, I think that's one. You know how many PINs I've seen since? A lot. Oh. You know, it's kind of like the philosophy. If you don't know what a polar bear looks like, you're never going to find it in the snow Or you need the criteria, what's the difference between a PIN femur and an AEX femur? One's posterior on the internal side, that's a guy's head listing, and one's anterior on the external side. So if one turns, which one's which? As long as you have good integrity of the joint, the other side doesn't come off its axis. This misaligns on the one side, unless there's compromise to the whole supporting soft tissue mechanism. But those are the things that make those people, your practitioners, better to help the last 5% of the patients. You know, I remember Parker, Jim Parker, 
used to say, you know what the problem with chiropractic is? It works too good. Because you can kick most of the patients in the rear end and you get results 80% of the time. And you used to say, as long as you did it specifically. I don't know how that had it in. But that's what you got to do. You have to recognize it. You know all the criteria. So let's get into this and let's evaluate a little bit. So we're going in the, uh, well, I'll just tell you, a lot of people are here. So here's my announcement. I've decided to make the best resource ever in the chiropractic profession on extremities for you guys. It's going to be a website. You're going to be able to go to it. Everything that I have in my possession that I create will be there. You can go there. It'll be an extension of the book. But all the slides, everything will be on there. And guess what? It's free. No. <laughs> you know how much that costs? For that? <laughs> you know how much it costs for guys like that? You know how much it costs to animate things? This is going to be really cool. Every x-ray that you take, like a comparative knee, you'll be able to go to that area and click on, let's say you don't know what an AIN femur looks like, or the PIN. You click on the PIN femur and it misaligns right in front of your eyes. So you know how it misaligns. But the best part is, because Dr. Gantz had always said, before you adjust something, visualize how it goes back together. Then it goes back into its normal. And if you're starting out, you will not know what normal is. You know how hard it is to find normal in your practice? Because you don't x-ray normal. You x-ray people that have conditions. So that's why it's going to be good to have a model to compare to initially, like every x-ray that you start with, then click on it, and that's going to be a lot of misalignments. Right? 26 bones in the wrist, 24 in the foot, plus everything else, TMJ, all that, ribs, SC, AC, I'm not going to name them all. But you'll have that resource to be able to look at that. Then you'll be able to see just in real time. Okay? Oh, before I forget, we need to have a sign-up sheet. How many in here need hours? Okay. So we need to make it, before I forget, let's make a sign-up sheet. We put on here hours. Six to nine, with the date, on board. And then if you'd make another sheet, if any of you want information on what I'm talking about this website, sign the sheet. There are also, before I forget, there's a landing page up right now that will start showing you preliminaries. And I've already put some case studies on there, so write this down. This is where you're going to go. It's extremitypro.com forward slash Gonstead forward slash. There are two case studies on there. The other benefit of having this website, if you've got a patient case that you want me to consult with you with, you can send it to there. I'll comment on it, do a full workup, and then post it. And then it'll be archived. So you'll be able to go back to it. <coughs> okay, does this sound cool? It's gonna be a fair, I'm excited about it. It's gonna be fun. Okay, let's look at this. Extremity protocols. This basically, hopefully you can see all this. This is poor nutrition. There was a tablet up here in the stomach, tablet in the transverse colon, tablet in the or ascending colon, and one in the rectum. Does that nutrition help anybody? No. Outside of an intestinal scrubber, 
those are not breaking down and absorbing into the body. That's Centrum Silver, by the way. I have a good friend that owns a porta potty company, and basically he says the worst problem that we had are undigested supplementation or vitamins. He goes, even some of them, you can read the label. So pick your nutrition well. Everybody should supplement because you can't get it from the food. You can't eat that much. I'm also a nutritionist, so I'm just telling you, be careful with that. And so I wanted to put that in as an x-ray because a lot of you probably have not seen that. But you will in your practice. Okay? Okay, let's talk about shoulder. When we do a shoulder view, we want to make sure that we include the medial border of the scapula. Okay? We're taught in our x-ray class to extra central ray right here. We want to make it right here. So we can include this and this and split the difference. Because what's the major stabilizer of the shoulder complex? It's the scapula. Okay? So, if you had a, glen, uh, a glenohumeral misalignment, and you had a scapula misalignment, Outside of the spine, which one would you do first? What did Dr. Gonstead always say? You adjust the good to the bad or the bad to the good? Bad to the good. You adjust the bad to the stabilizer, or whatever stabilizing that area. Okay? So, we want to evaluate what's that scapula doing, number one. So when you put up this A to P x-ray, and that's a neut just neutral position, arm hang down, not anatomical, just neutral. You want to evaluate this first. Now let me give you a general statement. Is that when you're looking at x-ray, because we're chiropractors, we're always looking for misalignments. Please look at the x-ray, because I took the deck bar course, is that they teach you to look at the x-ray globally. You want to look at everything. You want to look at everything. So you start out and then focus in to determine your misalignment. That make sense? Okay? Because if you just go, okay, they got shoulder pain, it's right here. I'm just going to look right here. How do you know it's not this cause of that impingement syndrome? If you don't look at this. So if it's a shoulder complex and it's a glenohumeral joint, you're thinking C6, C7 subluxation, right? Most often. If you're looking at scapula, you're looking at maybe T3, T4 is the major. But my point is, Look globally and then start in. So the first thing you would evaluate in a shoulder complex x-ray is the scapula. The superior ala should be one to two millimeters above the clavicle. One to two millimeters. Okay? How are you doing? It should, the medial border, be perpendicular. The inferior ala should be as a perpendicular, but it should not approximate the rib angle. Or should it approximate the spine? It should be straight up and down. Okay? So, scapula wise, if it's greater than one to two millimeters above, you'd have to have a superior component. If it was below, it'd be an inferior component. If the medial border goes towards the ribs angles, it would be turned lateral. If it go towards the spine, it would be medial. The scapula, because it's approximation to the ribs and it's subscapular bursa, because that's not a true joint, can only go posterior. The only way it can go anterior is if the ribs fracture. 
and get compromised. So the most common scapula misalignment is a posterior and lateral. The next most common is a posterior lateral superior. The next most common is posterior. The next most common is posterior lateral inferior. Okay? And then the last is posterior medial. And it all depends what's going on here. But can you see how this scapula affects a lot of things in the complex? The GH, the AC, and the SC. And it all starts right here. Most of you that send me films and say, you know, I get good cavitation on the AI because the AI is the most common glenohumeral joint misalignment. In other words, you have humerus. But it's not staying. And then you send me the x-ray, and you got a posterior lateral scapula. I said, have you ever adjusted the scapula? No. That's the problem. You're adjusting the GH, getting good cavitation. You're adjusting the bad to the bad. No stabilization. Will it eventually come around? Maybe. You're adjusting the right subluxations of the spine, but not always. Wouldn't it be better to be more streamlined? And wouldn't it be better that your patient at the country club says, yeah, I had this shoulder problem. Yeah, I know, you had quick golf the other day. How come you're back so soon? Well, I went to the chiropractor, he found the problem. He said that I, I had a misalignment on my shoulder blade in addition to the spine, and then I had to get that adjusted first, and then the shoulder joint. Took three adjustments, four adjustments, and now I'm fine. Or would you rather say, well, I've been doing that adjustment, it gets behind me and sets that up. How many times have you done that? Oh, about nine times. You better? No. Which scenario would you prefer? Especially in light that negative travels 17 times more than a positive statement. You want to hit it the first time. And you want to say, if you can, we have to go through a process to get to where we're, otherwise it's not going to stay, and you run the risk of making the worst. What are the worst words or statements said to you from a patient? Doctor, I don't know what you did to me last visit, but I'm a lot worse. You never want to hear that. Especially two visits before, they're saying, boy, I tell you, this, you're, you're getting this done. This is good. And I'll never forget that, you know, if you're evaluating and all of a sudden your innate, your innate says, I don't know if I should do this. It's telling you, don't do it. <laughs> and leave it alone. Just as fine only. I don't know how many cases I've had like that. Finally, I got smart enough to leave it alone. Do something else. Okay? So we want to evaluate that. The next thing that we look at is scapula. We want to make sure that that's okay. And let's say there is no change here, and all we see that the <coughs> glenal fossa is not elliptical, it's more oblong, kind of egg shaped. That's where you see straight posterior because this is raising off. The greater the posteriority, though, the more that this superior ala becomes pointed. Look at my hand. Thumb side is the medial border. So, and you're looking at the other side, but as it rotates posterior, you see more or less of my fingers. that tells you it's going posterior, okay? Especially if it comes down along rib angle, okay? The joint space 
at the head of the humerus as to the acromion process should be symmetrical. All right? The AC joint, the distal clavicle, should be one to two millimeters above the acromion process, the normal scenario. The space should be somewhere between 8 to 13 millimeters, depending on age. Anything greater than that, you've got to start calling it a separation. Normal is 1 to 2 millimeters wider at the superior aspect of the joint than it is at the inferior. So in other words, it's like this. Okay? That's normal. And the uh, SC should be a good approximation to the sternum. Okay? The head of the humerus, this is an old Mesham's book. So this drew it. It should be an equal joint space all the way around here. So they drew this as a anterior internal. That would be the misalignment of this. Okay, because the internal joint space is closed and the lesser tuberosity is more apparent. So that would be an anterior internal. When the transverse distance across gets greater, but you start to see the greater tuberosity and maybe the fovea, little indentation up here, then you know it's anterior external. Okay? Any questions on that? And literally, if it's, if it's straight anterior in normal scenarios, or no misalignment, you have, like the head of the humerus, kind of like ice cream on a cone. It's sitting right on the cone. When it becomes external, it starts to fall off medially. The medial joint space increases. Greater wedging. Open. Okay? Any questions on any of that? This is how we take that. Neutral position. See how the central way is not over here like you're taught for a shoulder view? So we can get the medial border of the scapula. It's right here. The other view that I recommend is an A to P external. So see how all he's doing is turning his thumb out. No abduction of the elbow. You don't want to do that because it'll move the scapula. This in itself will move the scapula. The reason why you take this is it's a stress view. You're evaluating motion. Is there good integrity of the joint? Because when you turn this out, the head of the humerus should have a greater transverse distance. It should drop down in the joint. It should drop down, but no greater than 50% of the original presentation on the AP neutral. Did you hear what I said? Do I need to repeat that? Repeat it? When you do the A to P external view, in other words, you're just turning that thumb out, the joint space between the head of the humerus and the chromium process should increase. In other words, wider. Should be symmetrically wider, but it should not be greater than 50% of the original presentation. If it is, now you can add the listing Inferior. Here's the statement. The greater the inferiority, the greater the instability. The most common glenohumeral joint is an AI, 85 to 86%, 85% of the time. And that's why you all get pretty lucky by doing just one seated move that occurs most often. But if you've got a scapula problem, it's not going to stay. Because you, you really got to hit them pretty hard to move the scapula in an AIC to move. 
you're supposed to be stabilizing the scapula, right? With your pec in a seated position. Okay? So when that externally rotates, greater transverse distance should drop down. If it goes greater than 50%, then it's an AI, okay, with great instability. The greater the anteriority, the greater the fixation. So the greater the anterior with external, the, mo pre the most predisposing factor to frozen shoulder. And abnormal malposition of the biceps long head tendon. Almost every frozen shoulder has that that you need to reduce. And it's due to what we would term the anterior with external rotation component. Okay? So the greater anteriority, the greater the predisposing factor to fixation, the greater the inferiority, the greater chance for instability. Okay? Everybody got that? Okay. The other thing that happens by this external rotation is the medial border of the scapula moves towards the spine in a normal scenario. So if you're doing this x-ray and you're comparing it to the A to P neutral and the scapula doesn't move, you know that it's fixated. And you better look there first. How many people knew that before I said it? Well, you better know that. <laughs> right? That's huge. That right there tells you maybe you should x-ray. and seeing that blueprint, what's going on. And you know, and the other thing that's great is that you have something visual to show to the patient because majority of people, 79% of them, are visual in their taking in information, especially in making decisions. And if it's a medical legal case, you're gonna wanna have that in case you gotta go to court. You can explain to the jury, yeah, this accident caused this misalignment. Well, was your care reasonable and customary that you adjusted them so many times? Well, here's the post film. Looks better to me. What do you think? Validates your care. Okay. This is what we're taught, baby arm, cross check lateral. It's a difficult x-ray to read. There's a lot of superimposition of structures. And you're not looking at this scapula, you're looking at this one over here. So I don't recommend this view as a routine. If you don't think it's dislocated, if you're not sure or not, you can take this view and it'll tell you. And we're talking about this shoulder over here. Okay? But otherwise, I don't like this view. There's better views. This is an internal, see I turned thumb in? Didn't rotate anything else. Why would we take an internal? Why do we take opposing x-rays? Because if there's trauma, we want to see other sides of structures. We want to see if that motion affects that. Okay? When you do internal, the joint space medially closes and the lesser tuberosity, if I told you before, increases. And it looks like this. This is a posterior scapula view. I think this is a better view to evaluate if it's dislocated or not. And this is a better view to evaluate if the scapula is fractured. Scapulas on Pratt Falls, or where you fall directly on the shoulder, usually fracture right under the spine of the scapula horizontally, sometimes at the acromion process. 
this is the right view to take to see that. Plus, you can see if the head of the humerus is where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in that nice little Y area formed by the spine of the scap and the acromion process. If it was anterior, be over here. If it's posterior, be over here. How many of you have seen a posterior superior scapula? Or a posterior superior glenohumeral? You know why? Because you don't know what it looks like. You probably don't know how to pop it. How often does it occur? Maybe one in five years. Maybe. And you would evaluate it from here. It would be up over here. So in other words, when you're doing your motion in that, and you come up with your AP glide, or your AP challenge, and it's posterior already, it won't rebound anterior, it won't go, when you bring it forward, it goes posterior, but when you bring it back, it won't go anterior. Because remember, extremities move in the direction of misalignment, not in correction. Then you have a posterior, you might do this view to see if it is. Okay? What's the most predisposing factor to anterior glenohumeral dislocation? I know it's early and I'm asking you questions. You didn't expect that. But I'm not looking at anyone specifically. What's the number one predisposing factor? He says bad ligaments. How do the ligaments get bad? It's because of what? Okay, injury stretching, but how did that get predisposed to have that in the first place? Subluxation, right? It's a neurological deficit going to that. As my opening statement, you may not have been here, that God said fix those, and that's what he said caused the extremity misalignment. Okay? So glenohumeral, C6, C7, scapula, probably T3, T4. So T3, T4, fixated scapula, because do you know the defense mechanisms on how it all protects the nervous system? Let me ask you this. How many in the room believe that our body protects our nervous system at all costs? Okay? Over anything else, over vascular, over everything, right? Neurological makes the world go round. And that's the chicken before the egg, right? Because you don't have neurological, you don't have blood supply, because blood supply takes, more, takes direction from the nervous system, because it controls, regulates, and powers everything. Because I have people argue all the time, well, blood is the most important thing, because it takes our immune system there, and the healing properties, and all, okay, what guides and directs that to happen? Nervous system. So literally, and if you go back to Dr. Sue's work, 19... Uh, what is that, 76, 77? University of Colorado. He found how much pressure, 40 millimeters of mercury, you know, caused, you know, for 30 minutes, caused a reduction of 60% of the nerve flow. But their defense mechanism, what are the defense mechanisms of the spine? You've heard me say this before. What are they? What's number one? So in other words, if you're seated at a light in your car, and you get rear-ended, what's the first thing that's challenged? Even if you know it's coming. Cervical curve. So in other words, curve alignment's number one. What's number two? If one doesn't dissipate the stress, and now it's progressing, and it's going to damage the nervous system, the body goes full in to protect it. Alignment number one didn't change it. Force is too great. What's number two? Yes. Muscle contraction. Somebody comes up, slaps you on the back head, you don't know what's coming, do you just fall down and relax or do you tighten up? You honk her down, right? Second protection mechanism. What's third? Muscle blows by it, muscle tears, get a strain, rupture, whatever. Okay, what's the next thing? Ligamentous. Ligaments hold bones together, muscles move them. 
Blows through the ligament. Ruptures it. What's the next? What? No. Spine would be disc. Knee might be cartilage, meniscus, capsule. <coughs> the last is? Bone. So if you get a fracture of any area, it compromises the first four. So when you're explaining medical legally, they said, well, this is just soft tissue. No, really, it fractured the bone. Oh, so we just had a fracture, it's got to heal. No! We have to have, we have to restore this patient. We've got to have alignment. We've got to have muscle healing. We've got to have ligamentous. We've got to heal the disc in addition to the fracture. So not only is that good medical legally, but when you explain it to the patient, we've got a whole lot of stuff to heal here. It's not going to take four adjustments. Well, I don't know, Doc, last time you adjusted me three times, that was good. So you need to know those things and show them, and that's why x-ray really helps. If you've got separation of joints, you know the ligament's been damaged. Yeah, it's bad, but we've got to get good approximation and get the neurological component there so all this can heal up. Will it be as good as it was the first time? No. Soft tissue always will have a scar. Your job is minimizing it and making it as functional as possible. By reestablishing nerve supply, blood supply, having the nutrient resources there, and have good biomechanics there on. That's your job. Right? Say uh huh. Yes. Thanks. Just want to make sure you're awake. So, this is the scapula view. We're going to evaluate that and also see if there's any fractures in there. Okay. What's the number one cause? A posterior dislocation of the glenohumeral. In other words, it goes behind the scapula. Number one cause. What? He said a fall. What was the other? What? Seizure. Seizure number one. Grand mal. It's number two. Electrocution. So, patient comes in. They've got a dislocated shoulder. It doesn't look like it's sitting here. There's no shoulder roundedness. You're palpating, it's back here. You get a history from the patient. Well, how did this happen? Well, I don't know. I got woke up, got off the floor, and okay, seizure. Why did they have the seizure? You better find out. Is it neurological? Is it some kind of you know chemistry imbalance? What is it? Then you've got to decide, is that something that's within my expertise and scope of practice? If it's your first rodeo on a posterior, you send it to somebody else. Anteriors, easy. Here's the other thing on a posterior. You don't have a posterior dislocation without chromium fracture. Doesn't happen. Chromium has to fracture. Okay? So you've got to deal with that. Now, if you were on a, you know, in an island, and it was your loved one, you're going to reposition it. Both orthopods will say it's better to have it in its right position to reestablish nerve supply and blood supply than to be worried about where that fracture is going to go. I've worked with a lot of orthopods on teams and they much do that. But, here's the thing, their scope of practice doesn't allow them to do that. <coughs> we can, as long as you're in their state law. If you got a state law you cannot reduce dislocations, don't do it. Unless it's your loved one, or it's a relative, or it's a team member, and through your evaluation, it spontaneously <coughs> reduces. <laughs> When in doubt, axial traction fixes a lot of stuff. Okay? All right. Now, head of the humerus, right here. It's above the acromion process, right? 
Is it? In projection it is. But is it truly? Here's a statement for you. The higher that is in projection, the more anterior the head of the humerus is. Because when you take that central ray, we've got it sit right here, or even if you add it over here. Do those central rays come out straight? They diverge, don't they? So your object film distance, even if it's digital, will be greater. So the more anterior, the more deviation and production on whatever screen you're capturing it. So the more anterior, the more superior it looks in projection. Okay? So this would be termed anterior. See how our ice cream sits right on the cone? Well, we should add equal joint space. So in other words, the head of the humerus ought to be down here, not here at the acromion. And we should have equal joint space all the way around. <clears throat> Anybody not get that? It's okay. I'm not going to pick any. I'm just going to explain it again. No? Okay. So, when we look at this, and I drew them as normal, should have equal joint space all the way around the joint. Our medial border of the scapula ought to be vertical. It should not approximate the rib angle, it should go towards the spine. The superior ala, one to two millimeters above the scapula. If you could see the distal clavicle, this is separated, it ought to be one to two millimeters above the acromion process. One to two millimeters wider at the top than it is at the bottom, eight to 13 millimeters total. Greater than that, separation. And everybody's a little different. Usually when we get up into the high 18s, 19s, it's separated. Okay? Should be elliptical. When it becomes oblong, that's when it starts to show that this is rotated posterior. You're looking into the glenal fossa. Okay? This is the external view. We're turning that thumb out, right? We're not abducting the arm, we're just turning it out. What should happen? Joint space medially should widen. If it doesn't, something's fixed. In other words, stuck. Joint space should increase. But it should not be what? Greater than? 50% of the original presentation on the AP neutral. But it should drop down. If it doesn't, the humeral's fixed. Stuck. <clears throat> okay? Should drop down. Now, when you look at that, and this is what Gonstead always said, you're not looking at structures and lining up bones in that. You want to look at the articular surfaces, because that's where it's supposed to go back together, right? So the articular surface of the humerus is right there. The articular surface of the scapula is right here. So it's dropping down. That's what you compare it to. And then always make sure that what you're comparing it to is not this line that it's in normal anatomical position. Otherwise, you have to take that misalignment into account. Is it making it look greater or less in misalignment than what I'm comparing? Greater transverse distance. It should normally get greater. If it doesn't, humerus is fixed, stuck. And the medial border of the scapula normally should go towards the spine with just turning the hand out. So it gives you a stress look. Is that scapula fixed or is it not? If it is, after the spine, that's where you're going first. Then to this. 
if this presentation is on your AP neutral, what do you got to think? You got to think an AEX, humerus. AEX predisposes bicep long head to go lateral. Now, if you read most textbooks, it'll say that the bicep long head normally goes medial in its misalignment. Yeah, that's after you compromise the rotator cuff greater than 50%. Most of the time, it goes lateral. If you find it medial, you've got a real rotator cuff problem. Okay? And the AEX is the most predisposing factor to what? Frozen shoulder. Okay? Here's that again. That's where it should be. Here's the EX part. See, did it move? Yeah, it moved. Drop down. Here's the articular surface. Here's the articular surface. Wider joint, greater transverse distance. And we see the phobia. <coughs> So the GH is good, so it must be a scapula problem. And drop down. Okay, posterior lateral scap, most common scapula misalignment. See how pointed it is? See how it approximates rib angle? That is very lateral. It gets that pointed. And you can see that this is becoming more oblong. It's wider, it's more egg shaped. <clears throat> Any questions on shoulder? Okay, going to elbow. Elbow, we take a 90 degree lateral, flat wrist, thumb up, and an A to P. We want to make sure that we're at 90 degrees. If you cannot approximate 90 degrees, more than likely there is a humerus distal misalignment. Everybody got that? Okay. If it's a humerus, di humerus distal misalignment, the joint space in the sigmoid cavity is closed at the back. So in other words, normal scenario should be equal joint space all the way around. If it's closed at the back, posterior distal humerus. If it's open at the back, posterior proximal ulna. Okay? Radial head ought to be one to two millimeters above the capitulum. You should not see the articular surface of the radius. Here you see it. When you start seeing the greater tuber or tuber, radial tuberosity, you know that the radial head is starting to become more lateral. Okay? Is this just boring the hell out of you guys or what? No. Or is this soaking in? I mean, this is going to make you guys experts. You're going to be an extremity problem. It's, it's all in the book. It will all be on the website. All these slides, everything that I produce, even the new stuff that I did, the case studies that are on there right now when you go to it, that link I gave you, that's all new. There will be new cases at least twice a month on there. At least twice a month. Okay? Hang in there. We'll get through this, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and we'll do hands-on. Okay? So don't go to sleep or go away yet. 
So we should not see the articular surface. If we see the articular surface here, then we know that that is lateral. If we see the articular surface on the AP film, then we know it's anterior. If we see the joint closed and we don't see the articular surface, we know the radial head's posterior. We'll get to that. Okay? So, we should add equal joint space in the AP film. The Mishan book drew this as a misaligned radius. Do we see the articular surface? Yes. Is the joint space closed? Yes. This then term would be an anterior radial head. Anterior radial head. Now let's look at one more thing. In an AP view, should the radius and the ulna cross? Answer is no. If you see them cross, especially in close proximity to the joint, radius is lateral. When it goes lateral, cantilevers. In other words, this part goes out, this part goes in. That's why it crosses. So when you see that, you know that the radial head, or the radius, is lateral. Okay? Are you asking the book because you're not writing any notes? <laughs> no, I am writing notes, <laughs> okay. actually. All right. But you're just saying a lot. Well, didn't you come to hear a lot? I did. Sure. <laughs> just verify the information, everybody. Or do you want me to just talk slower or no, no, no. just say, and that's all, folks? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want you to get as much as you possibly can, okay? So here's our AP. Try to get that elbow palm up, shoulder down as far as you can, tabletop. Now it might be a little difficult, but now digital's got what? A movable plate, okay? Bluetooth or whatever. Okay, and lateral, 90 degrees, flat wrist, thumb up, okay? Why do we do this? Because you want every x-ray reproducible. So you can compare it. You look at it. Oh, yeah, that's definitely radius. Oh, yeah, that's definitely distal humerus. And then you evaluate it. Is it on the patient? Yes, it is. What if they don't agree? Then what? Let's say your x-ray findings don't match up to the patient. Then what do you do? X-ray them again? No. You go with what the patient presents. Yes. Just a question on that. When you take that EP elbow, and I know you've got your uh, your apparatus, you've got the dimensions for that in the textbook. Oh, the, the step? The step thing. Yeah, yeah it's for x ray and weight bearing, but you can use it as a tabletop. How do you how do you position the body of the patient when you take the EP elbow? They're kneeling and then they're down. So they're kneeling next to it and just Yes. Okay. And then make sure you lead screen them. You know, you've got an apron or something. Sure. But nowadays, the film's so fast, and you can collimate down. They're not, they're not really getting much at all. So, but yeah, you want to do the tabletop that way. And this was lead. This is a lead screen. We do utilize that so we can take it on on one eight by ten. And now you're not doing that because they're imaged. You know, it's digital. You got a digital. Not digital. And digital. I was very reluctant to switch because I didn't like the way the film looked. When you're an x-ray guy and you took the DAP bar course and you get digital, there's a lot of echo in there. In other words, it bounces off the structure and then it gives shadows that, and I didn't like the contrast. You know, I suppose if I, I just recently sold my practice a year ago and so I'm still there by popular demand one day a week. This is the greatest job in the world. How many of you work four hours a week? Four hours a week. I work four hours a week and make $100,000 a year. What's better than that? And it's just because I have patients that would not go with the practice. 
that guy, I don't know what you're going to do. If you're not moving, you should be taking care of us. So I see my 60 to 70 patients every Wednesday in four hours. I mean, it's, it's great. Don't you think that's a great job? And then plus I get to do this and this website and travel around and speak. Do you know why I decided to do the website? Because I traveled 43 weekends last year. That's nine free people. Of course, I represented a company, a neural tech company, in the athletic seminars and all that. That's just too much. Of course, Dwight will say, how many of those had hunting involved? often as I could work it in wherever I was. <laughs> so anyway, matter of fact, I'm leaving here and going to where I hunted in Wisconsin to plant food plots after this. Okay? All right, so lateral. But I decided that I'd put everything online so maybe you guys could get it and I wouldn't have to travel as often. And I kept having people in Malaysia say, I can't come over. Can you at least do, come over? Well, you can't do that all the time. So literally, the certification will be online that you can take at your leisure and get certified. Your test will be online by Zoom call. You still have to take a physical exam. The people in Malaysia will be able to get certified from the information. Yeah, it's crazy how they can do tests online and all that stuff now. It's, it's crazy how it is. Okay, normal scenario, equal joint space. Okay, nice and equal. Good approximation, does not cross over. This is normal A to P elbow. That's what it should look like. Okay? Lateral, this is, of course, closed at the back, so I drew it as normal to be equal joint space all the way around. Head of the humerus, one to two millimeters above. But what do we see? We see that articular surface a little bit, don't we? Not really prominent radial tuberosity, but we still see that. So it's not really anterior, but when you see that, you know it's lateral, okay? And it should be perpendicular, but it is, and it's a little greater. So that's the reason why it's closed at the back. Remember I said when you don't see it perpendicular or you can't get it in that position? Then more than likely, you have a distal humerus, and it is in this example. Posterior ulna, open at the back. Okay? Another one, open at the back. Where well, we're talking about radial head here, but also so this is a posterior proximal ulna and the lateral radial head because we see the articular surface. What else? That radial tuberosity starts to become pretty prominent. You said that's with anteriority? Um, anteriority, this would have to be greater than two millimeters. And then when you looked at your A to P, you would see that the radius and humerus distal would be closed and you would see the articular surface coming towards you in an anterior. So then it would be anterior lateral, which occurs most often. So anterior lateral, most often uh, elbow misalignment, then lateral, and then posterior, and then posterior lateral. That's how they run most off scene. Okay? Open or close at the back? Closed. Particular surface? A little bit higher. So it might be an anterior lateral. You have to palpate it. But this is a distal humerus because it's closed at the back. 
Open or closed? Open here, closed here. That's this is what I just told you. An example, young lady. So it's closed, but we see the articular surface, right? So we know it's anterior because it's coming toward us. But what else? Does it cross over pretty quick? So it's got to be lateral. So this would be an anterior lateral radial head. That's what you would list it. Okay? Slightly above the capitulum? Yeah, a whole lot. Right? So it's anterior. Radial tuberosity, so probably lateral a little bit. We see the articular surface. Here's the A to B. Articular surface right here. The joint space is closed, even though it looks, it's kind of washed out, but the radial head's back here. So that joint's closed. Does it cross over pretty quickly? You bet it does. It's very lateral. What's the general term for this misalignment? Lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, right? This is what it looks like. What else do you see in here, you guys that are really sharp? Spinal subluxation. Well, you see the spine through this? Is that nerve tracing or what? What's the angle of this humerus? Is that capitulum greater presented than this side? I'll bet you there's a posterior distal humerus. Because when you look at this, you see that backside here? I'll bet you that that's there as well. So there's probably some rotation here. <coughs> I'd throw this in for you ladies. <coughs> okay, any elbow questions? Okay? Let's go to wrist. Wrist now is a PA, PA, and lateral. Okay? What's the most important joint? Now, this is an old Misham book. This is when I was in school. But I learned after a while when they changed the vicular to scaphoid. Because they didn't think that you could have two scaphoids. Or two navicular, sorry. So they changed it to scaphoid. Okay? So the most important joint is the radial carpal joint of the wrist. So when you evaluate, that's the joint you want to look at first. Is the distal radius, <coughs> excuse me, a misalignment? So it should be equal joint space all the way around. That's a relationship to the scaphoid and the lunate. And it should approximate the distal ulna. That's the key. Don't worry so much about second row. It doesn't happen very often. Because first row influences second row. Maybe capitulum or capitate might be misaligned or proximal thumb. And see, they used to call them greater and, le greater and lesser rectangular. Now what do they call them? Trapezium. <coughs> okay. So we want to look at this joint. Anytime that you see the underside of the distal radius, because normally the radius at its dorsum is cantilevered. In other words, it is bent over the top. Anytime you see the underside of that, you know that it's posterior. Okay, in, a, in the projection of PA, all right? And we want equal joint space all the way around. So in other words, this is the problem. This is drawn as the scaphoid and the lunate are misaligned at their uh, articular surfaces posterior. That's what that would look like, because that joint space is closed. Our lateral styloid process of the distal ulna should be one to two millimeters above the radius at its distal point. And it should be equal joint space of the radial carpal joint as to the lunate and the scaphoid. No wedging. Wherever it wedges, open is the direction the lunate is gone. So if it's on the inferior aspect, it's gone anterior. If it's on the superior aspect, it's gone posterior. 
What is the most direct misalignment causing carpal tunnel? The answer is anterior lunate. How do you get an anterior lunate? How do you get a bone that's wider at the top fall through the carpal arch? I'll tell you what, in the essence of time. When you have a fixed, in other words, stuck, radial carpal joint or distal radius, catch this. Ready? Give it to Jane. Before I forget. Long standing distal radius fixation causes hyper mobility of the first row of carpals. Hyper mobility allows everything to move, elder skelter, so therefore the greater at the top lunate can fall through the arch and compress the median nerve. You cannot have carpal tunnel diagnosis unless there's median nerve deficit. You'll get killed medical legally. Run tons of cases in court on carpal tunnel. Matter of fact, I still have an orthopedic surgeon that does not like me. He's about ready to retire, though. Because I made a fool of him in court because he described the radial nerve being affected by carpal tunnel collapse. And he did a decompression surgery twice and took out the lunate. I said, why'd you take the lunate out? I would have taken the thumb out. It's on the radial side. Why'd you take the lunate out? So he described the innervation and on the hand of the radial, the radial nerve. And I said, well, it can't be carpal tunnel diagnosis. It's got to be radial. Neuritis. So how can you do a decompression surgery of the fractal retinaculum and take the lunate out if it doesn't even close the radial nerve? Sorry. No big money. Patient loss. I love that stuff, by the way. It's kind of fun. Okay, so lateral. Now, the other thing that you need to look at is that a lot of times you'll get malposition when taking the wrist. If it's an anterior lunate and it's dropped down, you'll have an extension malposition presentation. So if the patient, you're taking their wrist and they do this, more than likely it's an anterior lunate. You see that? So in other words, it's going to be this. If it's a flexure malposition presentation, posterior scaphoid or lumen. And I'll show you in a minute. Okay? We doing okay, Michael? Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. See, I had to get you on film. All right. So, flat wrist. That's our lateral. PA. Now that central ray ought to be more here at the radial carpal joint. It's a little off. But when we look at this, we need equal joint space all the way through. So I drew them as normal. And you see it's pretty much flat wrist, no deviation. Okay? That's your second banana, by the way. No, she had a banana. Oh. You were eating a banana then. Yeah. I thought you were. No. I'm thinking, wow, do you know how many calories are in that banana? <laughs> <laughs> okay, distal ulna over the radius. Now, the other thing is, do not look at the tops of the bones. You look at the articular surfaces. Okay? That's what God said, always said. Okay? The PA, drawn as normal, equal joint space. Now, this PA wrist. See the underside here? So I drew it as normal, but it really isn't normal. The distal radius is posterior. 
in this projection. All that and radius should articulate. Adolescent, of course, arrows. If you can, always buy the x-ray machine that comes with arrows already. <laughs> This is called a radial deviated wedge scaphoid. Separation of the distal radius and ulna. And you can see there's a lot of separation of joints in here. And that the radial carpal, that should sit against this and the distal radius because we see the underside here, this posterior. Okay, everybody get that? Now, extension position presentation. That's what it looks like. Wedge at the bottom, so anterior lunate. Drops the carpal arch, can compress the median nerve. Flexion, position presentation. Wedge at the top, the radial carpal between that and the lunate. Lunate articular surface above the articular surface of the radiocarpal joint. This indicates swelling. Distal radius and, and excuse me. Distal radius predisposing posterior scaphoid lunate at the articular surface. Number one cause of ganglion cyst in the wrist. Okay? Posterior lunate. Distal radius and all those separation. What's the significance of that? Well, it affects the flexor retinaculum. It literally can close the carpal arch on the soft tissue side, not on the osseous side. So it can pull up the flexor retinaculum or it can lower the carpal arch by expanding that. And the distal radius and ulna can separate horizontally, and they can separate P to A. Or A to B, actually. This is what you call a target-rich environment. Those guys are probably still out there. That's not very far away. All right. Any questions on the wrist? Moving right along. I do, I do have a question. So if you have a person that can't, just so I can understand this, if you have a person that can't do wrist extension, would that be then? Okay. okay. Let's do that real quick. Clinical check. We're going to do this in the evaluation. Everybody take your wrists and extend them back. Look, compare them. Anybody got a restriction? My right one's pretty restricted. Okay, this is really important to chiropractors because a long-standing distal radius posterior, what does it do? Causes hypermobility, right? So the first row of carpals get misaligned, but then it affects the thumb, all right? Jams the thumb. Do we use our thumb a lot? You bet we do, okay? Unfortunately, that's the number one joint to rapidly deteriorate because it has the worst blood supply in the whole body of any joint. So you need to keep that extension flexion working for you guys. So on a regular basis, you need to evaluate each other to, on that distal radius to keep that good. But that's a quick check. Now, any time that you can have the patient Evaluate and see the difference, and then you adjust them and it gets more normal. That's just showing it. And what do you think they talk about at the country club or at dinner table? Yeah, I tell you, let, let me see your wrist. Oh boy, you got a bad problem. You better go see Doc. You'd be able to hit the ball farther. Help your ball. Absolutely. <laughs> you ever heard of a strong or a weak grip? Or they have wrist pain because they can't have the full range of flexion. If you restrict it 15 degrees, then it becomes overuse at any joint. 
15 degrees, so it's all good. Okay? So you can show that. Same thing with the feet. You pull the feet back, there's restriction. You adjust the talus correctly. Deepen. Like, wow. I hate to tell you, it's not the satisfied patient that refers to you, it's the one that's enthusiastically impressed. And the thing about it is, you don't know which one of those patients that you see is going to be the one that sends 10 to 15 patients to you. And if you hit that one with the wow, what I call wow, okay, they'll refer like crazy to you. You know, the book is called Working on Extremities. I call that the whoa principle. Working on extremities. Whoa eventually leads to wow. Working on wellness. You're always working on wow. Because you're making your patients well. So that's wow. So you always say, wow! <laughs> that was a good adjustment. Okay. Now I got you. Wait, we can finish. Okay, ankle and foot. X-ray at least 40 at 50. Caudal angle 15 degrees. This is an A to P ankle. We want to look at the relationship of the talus to the tibia. That's where the world goes round. Just like the distal radius is the master bone of the wrist, the talus is the master bone of the foot and ankle. You get that good, the rest of it will be good eventually, even if you're not good at anything else. Okay? Okay, this is the way we used to do it with the film. That was our step that we come up. If you need that, it's in the book, dimensions on how to do it. Okay? If it's a weight bearing joint, you better be x raying it at weight bearing. I want to see what it looks like. Oh, my yard sign, sorry. Nothing inside's worth dying for. But I would not shoot you in the back. I would shoot you in the face. <laughs> okay? And by the way, anytime you come to any of my seminars, you're well protected. There's guns everywhere here right now. So you know. And man, I don't know. Dwight, you got your gun? It's probably in the truck. Yeah. I don't go, I'm not far from mine ever. All right, this is an A to P foot. Doesn't give you a lot of information. See, we can't see our talus in the, our tibia tower. We can see talus as the navicular. And maybe we can evaluate bunion and the positions of the sesamoids, which is really important. But outside of this, it doesn't give you a lot of ankle information. Because the key is to know tower tilt. Most of you get great cavitation on the talus, but because you're not specific enough, you don't make a correction. You cause a separation. Now, if they have good integrity neurologically, maybe the body will put it back the way it's supposed to, and you get the credit. But if you think about it, you know, I have patients all the time say, Doc, man, you just healed me up so well. No, I didn't. I didn't do that. Your body did. I invoked a response. Your body took it and ran with it. Or I eliminated an impedance. That's all it is. If you think about anything, what does medicine do? Does it heal somebody? No. It invokes a response in their body to create it to work harder or direct it. Right? Just a bulk response. That's all it is. The body still does it. And it's the neurological aspect of it. Carpal tunnel that we just talked about. All of us should be handling carpal tunnel. Nobody else. Because it starts neurologically. I had a case, the guy came in. He had low back pain. It was work comp. So I got over the work comp thing. Because in Illinois, that's all you could work with at the time. Got all that done. And then he goes, I wish you could fix my carpal tunnel. And I, he goes, I've had nine surgeries. 
said, nine surgeries. So I said, well, let's evaluate it. And he couldn't move his wrist at all. Had no grip strength. Pinpoint sensation gone. And by the way, what do you lose first, sensation or motor? Sensation. Sensation. Okay? So, x-rayed it. I looked at his x-ray, and I thought, it looks like he got a gunshot wound. There's a big hole in his wrist. It just looked weird. So I finally, because I was so, like I told you, looking for the misalignment, I didn't look at it globally. Finally, I looked at it and I thought, well, why is there a hole there? Well, the reason why is they took out the lunate. And here's the best phrase for an orthopod. When in doubt, take it out. Right? When in doubt, take it out. So, this guy had two flexor retinacle decompressions. He had injections. He had a surgery to take out the lunate, and that didn't work. So they took out the first row of carpals. That's why it looks so weird. Because cabinet tape now is up against the radius <coughs> of the joint. And they cut off the styloid process of the radius and the ulna. And you know why? Because he thought the problem was that the ulna was too short. And were not scientific? Please. So anyway, here's the best part. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, okay, so you got carpal tunnel and all that. I said, let's evaluate your neck. C6. Guess what? Adjust C6. Don't adjust this wrist. I'm thinking, there's a lot going on here. I'm just going to adjust the spine and let the body prepare itself for the next adjustment. He comes in two days later, and he goes, I'm mad at you. I said, why? Are you, are you not doing well? What's it then? I'm 50% better. I said, why are you mad? Because I went through nine surgeries. You adjust my neck, I'm better. I said, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> so I adjust him again, because he still has a reading. I'm six comes in the next visit, he goes, I don't freaking believe this. It's gone. And I'm starting to get my strength back. He goes, the only problem is I can't flex or extend my wrist. <laughs> yeah, scar, you ever heard of scar tissue? So, you know, I have to admit to you, you guys realize I'm really kind of timid and meek, right? My personality. He's going, yeah, all right, this guy's flipped. If there's anything that I have a problem with, is that I have a go for it mentality. I'm getting better though, Dwight, right? I used to jump creeks. Now I buy really good boots and walk through them. Because <laughs> I can't take the landing on the other side. That's right. Okay? So I decide to adjust this guy, his wrist. What do you think I adjusted? Radius. Distal radius. I adjusted the distal radius after the subluxations were gone, full range of motion of his wrist. And that was it. Never adjusted it again. Never had carpal tunnel symptoms again. Never had to adjust C6 again. Is that just freaky? What did God said always say? You adjust the right subluxation, you get results. And it'll stay. So he went through nine surgeries, and all he needed was a cervical adjustment. That's all he needed. Nine surgeries for two Yeah. <laughs> well, chiropractic, because she said maybe chiropractic adjustment wasn't covered by insurance. But I gotta guarantee that guy would have paid whatever you were doing to get that fixed. Whatever you would charge. All right, so this, you would basically take this view if you're looking for fractures of the metatarsals or a bunion or something like that, or a bunyet. okay? 
See, you shouldn't be filming this anyway. <laughs> if I see that on the internet and you're, set, and you're selling it, I'm sending Guido. Don't worry, <laughs> I want you to know that I still have great communication with the guy that runs the Milwaukee Mob. Oh, no. He was my <laughs> classmate, and I saved his life once. This is a true story. So I got called up at Whitefish Bay, house on the lake, because Dad wanted to see me. He goes, hey, work. They all talk to me. Hey, work. Hey, you saved my son. I appreciate it. You need anything? It's done. You want him to be lost? You want Leg gone, broken, whatever. We do it. Second one, we talk about it. I haven't ever got the first one, so be careful. <laughs> and Guido's their hit man. He's probably 80-something now, but still. I think he still shoots good. <laughs> this guy isn't very far from me. What's that? This guy isn't very far from me. No. He had some really good stories. Do you know that his gun of choice was 22? You know, more people are killed by 22s than any other caliber. Yeah. I decided to have a little more power. <laughs> All right, assess points, you got to know where they are because you don't want to misrepresent. But this is what we're looking for. This is why you take the A to P angle. You want to be able to see this relationship. Should be equal joint space. Why do you see this? Distal tibia, she says. Posterior or anterior? It's anterior, you're exactly right. So I told you it's hard to find the normal. So this is an anterior tibia, because you can see this. But anyway, tower tilt, none. Little, a little deviation here, that would be kind of supination, and we see the underside of the distal fibula. Anytime you see the underside of the distal fibula, the fibula has gone posterior lateral. And then you got a fibula terminalum right here. That's a persistent emphasis or a that's fine. Okay. All right. That's what you're looking for. Tell or tilt. Anytime you have tell or tilt, that's going to be the restricted dorsiflexion side. It'll be the closed wedge side, the restricted side, and that's the side you want to contact to adjust. All right. On the lateral, equal joint space between the dome of the talus and the tibia plateau. See how the apex fits into the apex. On our tibia anterior distal, this apex would be in front of the apex of the dome or the talar mortis. That's how you would tell. <coughs> Symptom-wise, It'd be pain at the front and back of the joint on the distal tibia. And you would have restriction of both dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. All right? If you have restriction just of dorsiflexion, then it's an anterior talus. All right? If it's extreme with irritation at the divicular as well, then it's anterior superior, and that articular surface here, and related to the articular surface of the, of the navicular, has gone superior. Okay? So equal joint space. If it gets wider at the top, then you know that this has gone anterior superior. If it's close at the top, you know the navicular has dropped down as to the major. Equal joint space as to the calcaneus, as to the cuboid. And the subtalar joint is equal space all the way around. 
when that starts to widen, then you know that it's gone anterior lateral, the calcaneus, anterior lateral. If you see both sides, the articular surface of the lateral and the medial, now you know that it's gone medial, the calcaneus. Okay? Equal joint space. And a lot of times you'll see the drop of the arch. How do we get the arch to drop and which one drops first? How many arches are there in the foot? Three? Okay. What drops first? Transverse. Then medial, then lateral. Okay? Transverse is first. Okay? So, what's the number one cause of plantar fasciitis? Loss of the arch. And the second cuboid, not cuboid, cuneiform. They're throwing me off. Second cuneiform drops inferior and compresses into the top side of the plantar fascia. So it's direct irritation. So you adjust the talus and probably the navicular, maybe calcaneus, anterior lateral, and then the second cuneiform. Okay? To get that to stay. So you lose the transverse. You didn't bring me anything. I did. No, I got it right here. All right. So when we look at this, of course, this is an adolescent. Do we have Tower Tilt? Yeah, so we'd list this as a lateral Tower Tilt. So this joint's going to be fixed on the lateral side. When we contact this to adjust it, we would not go across the midline. We would keep our contact right here on the lateral side. When you palpate that, when they bring that foot back, and let's say the thumb side is the fibula side, it will restrict and not be able to come back. The medial side will continue to go farther. So the restricted side is always the high side. The restricted side is always the high side. Okay? Unless it's just straight anterior, which is rare. Distal fibula should be over here, should articulate with it. That's due to a lot of swelling. So, fibula ought to be here, it's back here. So, this is a posterior distal fibula. Most of the time when that goes posterior, it also rotates laterally. All right? How's this arch? Is that a 60 degree arch? No. The wedge, drop down, different space. What's our subtalar joint? So we definitely have a calcaneus too. So anterior, superior. Navicular inferior, anterior, <coughs> lateral. Probably second cuneiform drop down. And this is a young person with no arch. I blame the shoe makers. Everybody wants Michael Jordan or whoever, but they're terrible. They're expensive shoe, but they're not supportive. Bunion. Soft tissue swelling. Deviation, and these are bipartite. See those cess points are bipartite. Two parts. On a bunion, the problem is down here. See how the body's trying to fuse it? Because that's where the stress is. So you gotta adjust this first, then come up and do this. And then make sure that you relocate the cess points. You don't get those back under there, they'll continue to be here. Because the cess points help dissipate the weight-bearing stress. And you can see that even starting to get a little bunyette, because this is flared out on the fifth proximal ala. Soft tissue swelling. That's the bunion. So what do they do in the bunion surgery? Well, they used to do a bunionectomy, come and shave this off. Now what they do is they come in, and this actually happened to this person. See that line across there? 
They cut that right there, and then they turn that and put a pin all the way down through here. Let me ask you, did that help this case? No. Why? Because it was a neurological, biomechanical problem. It wasn't a structural problem. Uh-oh. Who was this? This wasn't you, was it? Last night. No, you. <laughs> You know, I don't know. Would you just say a soft soul instead of a hard soul? You know, kids technically should have good structure and biomechanics. So whatever allows proper pedal action is the is the case. You know, we used to have those footy shoes, and we had the footy shoes, and I used to say, if you've got great feet, it'll help. If you've got poor feet, you're nowhere the foot is the problem. And I had a lot of runners switch over to that, and eventually they took it. Hey, Doc, you're right. I got a problem here now. So, you know, and the really good Kenyan runners in that that run barefooted, they got great feet because they have pedal action and they're running on the dirt and they're getting grounding and all that stuff. So, but can you see, ladies? Look at this. I mean, how do you guys do that? <laughs> Okay, knees. We take them comparative. Do you take foot flare out? Yes. Do you take foot flare out on the ankle view? No. Foot flare out on the knee? Not on the ankle. Okay. We do them comparative, but we do the laterals separate. Hey, Doc. Yeah. Do back the slide. Do back the slide. What do you use? What's up with the apparatus? This? Yeah. Sponges. <laughs> <laughs> do you go to that in school? No. But the whole point is that you want to just have everything kind of lined up. You can use whatever, you know, on that. So. Here's our step, because we couldn't get the full spine bucky all the way down in the 14 by 17 tray, so we had to bring them up. Very sturdy. Okay, in the x-ray, we're looking at a couple things. Initially, we want to look at globally all the way around, make sure there's no changes in those areas, but we're looking at deviation of the patella. Is it lateral or is it medial? What's the Q angle? What's the overpresentation of the medial Epicondyle or condyle, and the joint space. What's the space between the fibula and the tibia? Those are the things you look at initially. Okay? Lateral, where's the position of patella? Is it alta? Is it breva? The condyles, the larger condyle, rounded, is the medial. The one that's more angled and smaller is the lateral. So if you don't know which misalignment is, and that's the case study that's on the website that I gave you, it talks about how to differentiate between different misalignments. So in other words, when we have Do you know how fun it is to travel with bones in your suitcase? <laughs> they always, they always, you know, if I got it in a carry-on, they always stop. And then you have to do this. So in other words, if it's anterior, on the medial side, I want you to understand it does not go posterior on the lateral in a normal knee, all right? So if it's AIN, comes around anterior on the internal side. If it's posterior or PEX femur, it goes posterior on the posterior on the lateral side. 
but it doesn't change the other side. All right? If it does, you have compromise of the supporting soft tissue structure. Okay? Like a cruciate or a lateral longitudinal or medial longitudinal in that, or PCL. That's a greater problem. All right? But I want you to understand that. It doesn't change that. So there's good integrity. So then you've got to decide. Did the medial go anterior or did the lateral go posterior? Well, how are you going to know? X-ray would help because then you can literally see it. Here's the anterior. Is the anterior really in front of the tibia plateau? Or is the lateral behind the tibia plateau? Now, the thing that you've got to understand is the tibia in its normal anatomical position. How do you know that? How do you know if the tibia is in its normal anatomical position? If the proximal fibula is posterior to the tibia, the tibia is posterior, you cannot have a posterior proximal fibula without a posterior tibia. Did you hear what I said? Let me say it again. You cannot have a posterior proximal fibula without a posterior tibia. So if this is way back, you know that this is back. So what you're comparing it to is not true anatomical. So if this is back, it's going to make the medial look more anterior and possibly the lateral lesser. You have to take that into account. But then, of course, you're going to challenge that on the patient. So literally, when you get them into that position, you're going to hold down the tibia, and if it's an AIN, it will move anterior on the internal side easily, but it won't go posterior. It won't go into a correction. If it's a PEX, it'll go posterior on the lateral side, but it won't go anterior. You get it? That's how you challenge it. And then you can go on pain findings. On the AIN, it's going to be anterior medial joint pain. On the PEX, it's going to be posterior lateral joint pain. Okay? They both deviate the patella lateral. Okay, I want you to write this down. EX femur misalignments decrease the Q angle. IN femur misalignments increase the Q angle. So in other words, if it's anterior on the medial side, AIN, our Q angle increases. All right, see that? If it was posterior on the external, decreases. So if all you had was an A to P, and by no means am I saying just take A to P's, you could look at it and look at the Q angle and maybe discern which one it is. Because EX, EXs will lessen it, INs will increase it. You didn't know that before, did you? Aren't you glad you came? Because there's a lot of people out there that need your help. Do you think I enjoy getting, getting in? I got three and a half hours of sleep last night. Do you think I enjoy getting up coming in here? The answer is yes. Because <laughs> I want you guys to be really good. You know what really excites me? It's when guys like this in the background say, and he goes, Doc, I can't believe how well your stuff that you taught me works. I just can't believe it. And the ultimate that I ever had was when Dr. Alex told me, when he looked at the book before, because I asked him, is there anything in here I need to correct? He goes, God stiff would have been proud. I started crying. And he, he's like, I, I still don't. And I got to thank that guy right back there, because 
He was my student doctor in school, and he brought me to this work. And I still come and get adjusted by him. By the way, don't leave. <laughs> I had a fall on the trail on my bike. See? Go for it mentality. How many people ride over a stick? The stick flicks up, goes in my spokes, hits the <laughs> frame, and twists the front wheel, and I go over. How many people do that? I don't know. You just don't get it. All right, so we're looking at patella. Lateral or medial deviation? Misalignments that laterally deviate. PEX femur, AIN femur, which is the most common knee misalignment, okay? Medial deviation is AEX femur and PIN femur, okay? Increase in the fibula tibia space, AEX tibia, decrease PEX tibia. <laughs> Okay? So the fibula can't go posterior unless the tibia is posterior. So when we do our AIN, lateral deviation of the patella, femur lines, you see they're out of the patellar femoral groove. Okay, they should be in the center. And in a normal scenario, should be directly over the top of the tibia line, which is in between the interarticular eminences. Put the tibia lines on. You see they're close. A little bit probably be a PEX because they're deviating towards the lateral, so a little bit. Articular lines are wedged open medially because <coughs> it's coming anterior toward us. Increase of the Q angle, right? It's almost like a ski jump. The medial condyle is larger. Well, it's larger anyway, structurally, because more greater weight-bearing stress there because of the Q angle, all right? But if you increase the Q angle, then that's more weight-bearing stress, and that's why medial meniscus wear out first. If you had a major PEX femur, or AEX, because it decreases Q angle, then the lateral would wear out first. Okay? So what's the predisposing factor to have an AIN femur? Anybody know the kinetic chain? Spot it off real quick. Posterior rotated sacrum on the side of an IN ilium or its combination creating antiversion in the acetabular cavity of the, of the femur head, which increases fixation and causes a anterior on the internal side deviation, increasing Q angle, or AIN femur, which has caused contrarotation of the tibia, PEX, or posterior on the external side, which causes the tibia talar joint to be fixated, causing hypermobility of the navicular and the cuneiforms causing loss of the transverse arch, medial arch, then lateral longitudinal arch, causing eversion of the foot, causing pronation, which causes a deviation and pedal action to cause uh, pronation and abnormal pedal action, which is, increases the loss of the arch, creating calcaneal field spur. Do you get all that? Can it go the other way? Yeah. Can it go the other way? Yeah. Only with subluxation neurologically. So in other words, if it gets to that point and you have a loss of arch, yes, it can come back up and create the posterior rotated segment. Usually spine down first and then up the other way. The only way that it would change, if you dropped an anvil on your foot and compromised the transverse arch, which created the eversion of the foot, then yes, it'll do that. But it's got to have a neurological subluxation to allow it to occur. If you don't have that, the body will not let it happen. Right? Okay. The
kinetic chain things in the book. Uh, it's also going to be on the website. So anyway. Now, because it's deviated and open wedged medially, we've got to hurry here. Okay? Your valgus stress test will be positive. Everybody know what valgus and varus stress test? Okay. So we put pressure on the side of the joint. It should open up on this side more unstable. When it does that, that indicates that the femur is the major misalignment. Because if you have a femur and a tibia misalignment, what do you do first? You got to do your valgus and varus stress test. That will tell you, and it's never wrong, unless there's always an exception. Unless they have some kind of inanimate object not connected to the nervous system. Otherwise, it's like a MI joint surface replacement. Um, maybe they, like they used to take uh, the quad, the patellar ligament and dissect it and put it in there as the ACL. They used to put cortex in there, all kinds of stuff. But normally that's the case. When you're stuck, do I adjust femur or tibia? Ferris and valgus stress. It's never wrong. Okay? Now, of course, that's after you've done all the spot. Because if that's not congruent, then that test will be false. We could have a false positive. Okay? You said it's always the femur if there's a decrease in varus and valgus? Valgus. Or just valgus. Just valgus. Valgus is lateral, opening up this side. That indicates femur. If varus is positive, then it indicates tibia. Okay? And it doesn't matter what misalignment of the femur it is. It'll always be true to that. So even though an AEX would open up the joint space laterally, it's still going to be a positive valgus stress test. Okay? Tibia space, those are equal. Okay? If they close, PEX, tibia. If they widen, AEX. If it goes where the tibia is side-slipped, greatly and beyond, where it shifts over, that's called EX side-slip, that is the most uh, predisposing factor to, for instability of the knee. The greater the side-slip, the greater the instability, the greater the EX. PEX, joint space, Wider at the lateral aspect, so our varus stress test will be positive. Our tibia line favors the lateral interarticular eminences. And our space is more closed between the fibula and the tibia. Okay? On our lateral, we're looking at the patella where it's at. What condyle is this? Medial lateral. It's the lateral. It's lateral. See how much big and rounded this is? That's the medial. See how that line comes down at an angle? So this is the medial, this is the lateral. So, is this posterior? Answer is yes. Okay? So we know this is posterior. That would make the anterior look greater, which it doesn't. This posterior lateral would look less. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking maybe this is a PEX femur until proven otherwise. Okay? If it was greatly outside here, way over here, then you might consider it an AIN. But, see, that's supposed to be up here. So you can't have this without this being posterior. EX tibia, there's a little side slip here. Also, we got an AIN, great Q angle, lateral deviation of the patella. Wedged open, 
great instability, but it's, see it's EX too. It's a, it's a PEX site slip. It's hard to find just an EX. Can you have an AEX site slip? Anterior on the external side, can you have an AEX site slip? The answer is yes. Okay. Let's see, here's the deviation that far. Okay, here's a clinical pearl. You ready? This is something you can do Monday. You get a case in, they're really hot, neat. You find that the pelvis is involved. It's a posterior rotated sacrum inside of an ASIN ilium. You decide that that's the major fixation, and you have a reading on your scope, so you decide to adjust that. You go down, you evaluate the knee, you x-ray it, and it's highly degenerative. Okay, bone on bone. And it's an AIN major. Okay? So when you do your varus, and valgus stress, the valgus is positive, but it's highly degenerative and it's very swollen. I want you to put them prone and adjust it as a posterior tibia. Okay? First adjustment. The reason why, there'll be fibrogen in the joint space and the meniscus. You need to break that up first. Open the joint space, create motion, blood supply, nerve supply. Again, I tell you that you can't go wrong with axial uh, traction. You're opening up the joint space and allowing that knee to now compensate beyond the fixation. Then the next visit, go back to your criteria. If they say it's a lot better, Consider doing it one more time. Then get into your specificity of adjusting. Okay? You want to open up the joint, let the body compensate to your spinal adjustment. More than likely, there's fixation, there's fibrogen in there, there's swelling, there's calcium. So open it up first. I found by doing that, it goes a lot better and you're just opening up the joint, allowing the body to compensate to your spine. Okay? AEX, medial deviation of the patella, decreased Q angle, less presentation of the medial conduct. AEX tibia, wider space between the fibula and the tibia. Okay? AIN. Well, actually, he said it was a PEX. Let's see. Yep. See how far that, that lateral is? You see that? Let's go back. Lateral deviation of the patella. The only thing that I don't see that this would be, that Q angle is still pretty good. So obviously, he checked it on the patient. This is a friend of mine sent me this in. So there's the lateral, and it's way back. And this is posterior, so it's way back. So obviously he challenged it. And then it's PEX femur. Is that a Yes. It's digital. Oh, so that's your model too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had that in my office a lot of, a lot of time. Okay, TMJ. Full jaw lowering. Don't we take our full spines or full jaw lowering, mouth open? So we might utilize that. Because you're going to evaluate the last motion of full jaw lowering. All right? If you look at the chapters, it says to do the first motion. I didn't really see that that stayed as well when you have multiple deviations. So do the last motion you see first, and then eventually it will heal up as it comes up. Okay? Deviate down and away. Cephasomenti is beyond the center of the spine. So if it drops down and away, it would be listed, and this, of course, would be the left side of the patient. This would be an AI right TMJ. Anterior and inferior. It's anterior and inferior. It's also 
because this condyle is greater. Angle of the jaw, it's an external as well. So it'd be an AI with an external right component. Go up down the way, deviation across. Here's the condyle. Or See how wide it is over here? And the angle of the jaw is prominent. Anytime you see the angle of the jaw like that, it's EX on that side. Okay? Panoramic view. But it's interesting, you can see how the articular surfaces are. They're anterior, inferior. Nasal septum goes into the Nasal cavity, this is after correction. And when you do that, they breathe better immediately. That's a very good pattern at 60 yards. <coughs> turkey, turkey. Okay, all this in the book. Don't hesitate to go get them out of the office. This is how you can get a hold of me. Cairo, personal email, that's the office. And this is how you get on the website. Okay, we're going to take a real short break. Five minutes, come back, and then you can throw whatever you want at me, and I'll talk about it, how to evaluate it, how to correct it, the whole thing. So we're going to set up a little bit differently, probably over in the corner. So we're out of the way of John when he comes in. So five minutes, be right back. Okay? Was any of this good? So good. All right. Gonstead Clinic in Mount Horb, Wisconsin. This is Dr. Working, and we're doing some hands-on evaluations. We just had a really good session on x-ray protocols, and I want to make sure that everybody understands what we're doing. We're filming a lot of this this weekend, and just so I don't forget is that you'll be able to get additional information. I've made a website now, and the landing page is up, so you need to go to extremitypro.com forward slash Gonstead forward slash and you'll get to the landing page and get additional information there's some case studies already loaded on there differential diagnosis as to knee misalignments and I did an evaluation on wrist trauma all the things that you need to know to get the maximum out of that go ahead and give a quick history 
in February, I slipped on some ice. This was my stable foot on the ground. And when I came down... So you were weight-bearing? I was weight-bearing. And when I came down, this was the foot that was planted. I kind of bent and twisted as I fell. I felt the pop. Now, and all of this time... The Can you slip your sock up too, please? Sure. And that, like I said, that was back in February. And all of this time, it still hasn't really healed. I have pain from here all the way up into here. Okay. I mean, and initially, you had on the lateral side, on the anterior right tower fib. Oh, you had on the posterior. Yeah. On the posterior just, uh, just right distal there. fibula. And I can still feel it. Okay. Yeah. Let's take the other suck off, too, please. Go ahead and lay back. Yeah, move that so you're comfortable. Okay, remember we talked about clinical checks? John, go ahead and move anything. Okay, I'll be done here in just a second. Remember we talked about clinical checks? We want to make sure that we dorsiflex the foot, so pull your toes back to you. Is there a difference? <laughs> Let's hope that you can see that difference, okay? So greatly restricted, right? So. We need to evaluate, we take our thumb and our index finger and we put it right into that joint on the talar dome or mortise. We dorsiflex up, we're looking for the closure of that joint. Remember I told you the closure of the joint is going to be the high side of talar tilt. All right? So when we do that, we restrict it, and let's say it's medial like this, well then the lateral will even go further. We can see that motion, verifying it. So, on the affected side, we have it up. We're going to take our index finger and thumb in the joint. We bring it up, and he is immediately medial fixed. So it's got to be the high side. Is there any more lateral motion? Yes. Okay? And it's probably tender there a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do you know that you always want to reproduce their pain? So they know you know where it is. <laughs> so my patients already say, Doc, do you always have to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, a little bit there, but more so here. So that's the fixed side, okay? It's the high side. So we're going to contact only that. So when we go to contact, we don't go past midline. Okay, right like that, superimposed. Thumbs on the bottom, dorsiflex the foot. Traction, keep our elbows in. Set, do you have any, because he's so restricted, I think he's got a little superiority. It's tender right in there too. Yeah. That's the navicular articulation. So remember I told you that it's anterior, superior, because of that being tender there. So, we're going to do a pull move. Pull moves you normally do when there's lots of periarticular swelling. This, of course, the periarticular swelling has gone, but we're still going to pull to open up that joint because he's so tender in that spot. Could we push it? Yeah, we could take the pelvic pillow, put it on here, and push straight down. But we're going to be pushing on that sore spot. So in this instance, I want to open that up for him and make it as comfortable as possible. And if you hurt them initially on the adjustment, they're going to be apprehensive for you to do it again. So, it's a lot better to start with a pull. Like that. Keep the knee down on the table and I'm coming straight back towards me. Just relax, relax. Trust me. There, we got it. What was that? No comment, he passed out. No. <laughs> okay, now, he's not even walked on it yet. Let's go ahead and see if it's helped at all. Pull your feet back. Wow. Any difference? Big time. You do the right thing, you get results. Right, Dwight? And that's the key to building your practice right there. So, I want you to get up and walk now, and okay. then we're going to reevaluate the rest of you. So, you want him to create motion. Now, wait a minute, just get up. No, barefooted. Just get up and walk a little bit. Right, okay. just back and forth. 
Should feel looser to you? Does it feel looser? Yes. We should have had him walk and we could have compared his gait because he probably would have had a little alteration of his gait. I, I did. Okay. I can feel the difference. I mean, it's. Okay. It's, it's a lot looser, weird. right? Yeah. Okay. I, now I back like down. More and it's going to be even better yet. Go ahead and back. Okay. Now pull him back. Pretty incredible, right? Now. To challenge the fibula, because he said a lot of his pain's back here. Get behind it. Like this. And challenge it. If it's posterior, it'll go posterior. If it's anterior, which is very rare, it'd have to be like a slide tackle, something like that, driven forward, blunt trauma. But when I push down, it should go that way. Shouldn't want to go forward. Definitely goes down, will not come back. And that's pretty sore back there, isn't it? Want that changed? Yeah. Go ahead and turn over. We're going to pull his posterior distal fibula. Now, when he turns over, make sure you're still on the affected joint. Because a lot of times, you know, the patient will go, well, that was great, Doc, but it's my other leg. And then, so you either have to say, well, I'm just warming up for the other side, <laughs> or do you realize there's proprioceptive changes, 15% carryover? So I want to make sure we open it up by doing the unaffected side. To open. No, don't do that. All right. So, I'm going to get right on the posterior aspect, because he's so tender, it's less likely I want to push it. Over the top, like that, and I'm pulling straight back. Supporting. Here we go. Relax. Good. There it is. Yeah, baby. Okay, go ahead and walk on it now. If you can. I'm being filmed. I'm trying to. I was hoping for a big pooping soccer. Okay, take your time. It'll loosen up. It's just that initial. As soon as it puts her. Yeah. see if the talus stayed. Pull back. Okay, we need a little more talus out is what the problem is. Okay, I'm, this won't hurt you. Pulling right towards me. I'm not going to go across midline. Right like that. Let her go. Let her go. Good. That's a lot better. Okay, pulling back. There you go. Now walk again. The only downside of doing that pull loop is that it affects the talus a little bit. But sometimes you have to readdress the talus. That's better now, right? Way better. Yeah. See, we moved that talus when we did that move. But we had to do it to get that fibula because otherwise it was going to stay way back. Okay. That should do it. You're a new man. Okay. Want to race me in the parking lot? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got a TMJ, right? Where's the TMJ? Let's do it real quick. I need a chair. Here. Okay. Does anybody have a scope with them? Yeah. Can I use it real quick? Okay, clinical pearl. You never evaluate or attempt any re adjustments, reduction, unless the cervical spine is reduced subluxation-wise. Otherwise, it can go badly, quickly. Okay? Thank you. Okay. You don't have to turn this on, right? Yeah. You do? The porcelain electronic. It's a temp scope, it's just right. 
When's the last time you got adjusted? Two weeks. Okay. Now, remember I said full jaw lowering. Let's go ahead, sit up straight, cervical neutral position. I want you to open your mouth as far as you can. Okay, you close? Okay, a lot of deviation, right? Just keep doing it. Or? Do it one more time. Okay, what's the last motion? It kicks over, so he actually, to close, he has to kind of side slip it. See how it EXs to come out? Okay. Go ahead and close. Now open very slowly. Okay, the last motion is what? What's the last motion? Which way does it deviate? Lateral left. Which way? To the left? His left? Okay, let's palpate it. Fingers one on the front of the joint, one on the back side of the joint. Now open. Okay. What it does? It literally does this. It goes down like this, like that, like this, and then like that. So the last motion is an AI right. Okay? Normally we would have a condyle block back here, but before we do that, we're going to have to adjust him. Okay? Atlas, is okay to adjust you? Sure. Okay. Here we go. Good. It wasn't bad for my second time. <laughs> Do I turn it back on again? Okay. Okay, that's gone. Okay, get up and walk for a minute. Anytime that you're trying to reevaluate, you want to reintegrate the body, have it compensate, so have them get up and walk and back down. Okay. Cervical neutral, eyes straight ahead, open your mouth. Is it better? Okay, still got the EX. Okay, now open. Okay, back in. Okay. EX, cervical stabilization, just below condyle the joint, open. I close halfway, right there. Now open, close. Okay, now he's got an EX on the other side. He's all over the place. Okay, now open. All the way. Yep, right there is good. Close halfway. There it went. You feel it? Yeah. Open. Now don't go full. Now close. Okay, open and close. Okay, he's a work in progress. The reason why we have that is that his condyles have literally worn a groove in the disc. <laughs> That'll take time to heal. So up your chondroitin sulfate, proteolytic enzymes, okay? Because that'll help remodel that. Keep your neck in place. Try not to open your mouth fully so that can heal. When you notice when I went to do the AIN, I deviated away and then brought it back up. The reason why we want to stay out of that groove that he's worn. Otherwise, it comes right back in that position every time. You're going to need a few adjustments to get to that point. But you are better from just adjusting the neck, so keep that good. And it was Atlas. Okay, any questions? I don't know. You were filming me the whole time. Why would I want to trust you? <laughs> what do you have? Uh, feet problems. Got me particular. Both feet. Um, let's look at your knee, since we haven't done knee. I have a lot of water on my right knee. Okay. Okay, go ahead and lay back. Okay, when we look at knees, we're going to look at... Primary assessment. See how this leg turns out? Increased Q angle, this is less, little rotation. Lower leg is posterior rotated, so is this one. Pelvis is turned this way, posterior rotated sacrum on the side on the right, correct? Yes. Yeah. I got lucky. No. <laughs> posterior sacrum on the right. 
Okay, so that's causing all this. So when we evaluate, we extend the knee up, is there any deviation of the patella? It will normally go laterally a little bit, but his really laterally deviates. Okay? Then we'll do our valgus and varus stress test. See how that opens up? Indicates tibia. All right? Just make sure I have a 23 millimeter PL synchro. Okay. So it's it's not right. But that hurts right there. Is that true? Yes, yes. Okay. See, I'm getting back at you. <laughs> this is what Guido will do, but to the 10th degree. <laughs> okay, what I want you to do is come up and walk. And just watch his gait. Okay? See how he picks that leg up? That right one? Because it's so rotated to the posterior. Okay, go ahead and face down. And this is his right side that we were looking at, correct? Yeah, that's bad. Um, do you mind if 110 people palpate you? <laughs> <laughs> is there no time for that? No, um, me, anybody have a pen? Real quick. Yeah, let me have a pen. <laughs> That's a posterior slip of the meniscus. Go ahead and feel that. And how I want you to feel it is like this. Okay? If you do not reduce that, the PDX will not correct. Will not uh, correct. You feel that? It's a posterior meniscal bulge. Lucky <laughs> you. Just relax. Yeah. Here. I know. I will square them all I want, though. I'm entitled to that. Go sideways on it this way. Feel that. Feel the like the side of your thumb. Okay. Feel that? Anybody else want to feel it yet? Okay. Does anybody have any hand lotion? Can I have some? I just need a little bit. <laughs> That's a good start. That's good. All right, you ready to suck it up, big guy? Yes. 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 Are you able to traction him? Can you grab on his ankle and just sustain traction? Okay. I'm going to put this meniscus back. It really doesn't feel good. I know. All right, you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, here we go. Traction him. Okay. Okay, there it went. You feel it? Okay, once you bring it up, you can let go of it. Okay, because it holds it in. Now. Let go of it or hold it? Nope. Now I'm going to do the PEX. Right like that. Relax. Good. There it is. Okay, now feel it. It's gone. This is insane. It's all worth it. Wait, come back. The drop in the viculars. <laughs> Anybody not agree that it's gone? It wasn't that painful, was it? 
I, I, I felt worse. Okay. Worse. Like I said, Guido will be a lot worse. <laughs> Please don't kill me. <laughs> See how you still have swelling of the capsule, but you don't have that ridge anymore. Aww. See, that's the number one cause of a torn lateral meniscus, is a PEX to me. Okay, everybody feel it? Done? Okay, get up and walk. I guarantee you'll walk different. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Now see how you swing both up and down, you gotta swing just the right one. That swag? How's it feel? Feels better. Feels looser. A lot better. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? We gotta let John Slip take it over here. Hey, send me an email if you've got any, you know, praises, questions, criticism, whatever. I appreciate you all your attention. Thank you so much. All right. Will people take this back, please? The bench? Thank you. No, I'm not. I can't do that. Did everybody sign the sheet? Uh